Hello and welcome to another episode of On The Couch. We've just about managed to get our guest this week to stop talking long enough to do an introduction. And uh, we're delighted to be joined by Liam Turner and Pat Hackett to discuss a, a book they produced or were involved in producing, Selsker 18, which is a very interesting production, uh, mainly about the Selsker area of Wexford Town. But there's also a big GA element in it as well. And uh, first of all, Pat, tell us about the book, a, a, a synopsis maybe of what's in it. Okay, um, well, a couple of us did a, a genealogy course in the People's College in Wexford, and uh, as a result, the, 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 our mentor, a man called John Nangle, uh, her, he was a genealogist and our teacher, and he got us to kind of to follow cold case genealogy, and I was delighted with the area he picked because I grew up there as a, as a chap and played with the football team that we talked about, you know, um, and so we picked a Selsker area. So I had good knowledge of it from the 1960s and 1970s. I lived down there for 30 years. So um, what he did was he picked 18 shops and we followed the people. We call it the extraordinary life of ordinary people. So we followed the people who lived in these uh, places. A lot of them were shops, businesses and so on. And um, we followed, uh, you know, their children and, and their grandchildren and so on because some of them stayed in the same family for 80 90 years but for some fantastic stories and I would have known some of the shopkeepers and, and residents from the 1960s and 70s so I had kind of the modern but it was very good to find out about the older people and so on and many of them traveled around the world and have, have remarkable stories and then I called my good friend Liam Turner here who was kind of an encyclopedic knowledge of Gaelic athletic he dabbled a bit himself and uh so he did, I got him to look up because I suppose our claim to fame in Selskers that we had the first Wexford football winning team, All-Ireland champions, and most of the players were from the Selsker area because it was a very big community and viable and, uh, you know, very, very prosperous area then. But from when I grew up there, it, you know, it, it kind of fallen really into decline and we were hard set to field teams but we did our best but um, nothing like the achievements of the men of old. And, and Pat just before we go on for anyone who's not familiar with the geography of Wexford Town where is the Selsker area roughly? Well I suppose the, the, the best thing is the Redmond Monument you know if you got off the train at Wexford Railway Station and my father worked on all my family worked on the railway apart from myself uh, it's just down there where the new Dunn stores is you know the, the, the the, the, the first North Main Street and Temperance Row and Well Lane and Ram Street it's kind of in the north end of the town mm. but as I said it's kind of a what it was urban renewal uh, kind of done in the 1990s and early 2000s and that kind of brought it back to life so whereas it's now the kind of the commercial most important part of Wexford now to a certain extent like it had fallen into decline big time but way back 150 years ago it was very prosperous and a huge population and a lot of very sporting greats. And I suppose being Wexford obviously being a seaside town would have helped the prosperity at the time I'd imagine as well. well to a certain extent but um, I suppose uh, the railway was a big employer then, you know, so many, uh, we're going to talk about the lads on the team, but a, a, a huge majority of the fellas on the team later on all worked on the railway and there was kind of ironworks down there as well, the Selsker ironworks. So there was a lot of kind of manufacturing and hands-on industry and uh, a lot of them were bakers and things like that, you know, and shopkeepers and not, did all those kind of jobs. Um, and I suppose just to explain as well, um, they were the all Ireland Villain team um, how did they come to represent Wexford? Well, I think they won the structure they was won different the, back then. Yeah. Yeah, they, I think that the way it was done then was whoever were the county champions represented the county because I know later on when Wexford won the hurling in 1910, the Castle Bridge team represented Wexford in 1910, mm. but the Selsker Young Irelands represented uh, Wexford in 1893 because it was the county champions, county football champions. Yeah. And Liam, does it, there is a big GA element to the production, naturally enough, which is Pat, yeah. the main reason why you're here to discuss the <laughs> 1893 team, amongst other things. But it must have been a very interesting thing to research and discover. It was, and uh, just to put you to right, Pat said I was asked, I wasn't, I was told by Pat I was getting involved, because his <laughs> opening line was, he said, your dad was from Selsker, wasn't he? And I said, my father was born in Red and Ram Street, which is now called Skeffington Street. So to say I had a choice wasn't really true I was told I was being involved but when he spoke about the project and about the night class and stuff like that of course I opened my big mouth and said she must be talking about the 1893 team and he said no no we haven't 
done anything about that. He said, but you invent on it. And I said, sure, yeah, I'll do something on it. So that was the initial involvement, uh, from my point of view anyway, I was getting involved because they were the first team to win in All-Ireland from Wexford. And it's only when you delved into it then you looked at, there were so many unusual features attached to that team. Like there was 17 side at the time, mm. which was an awful lot of people are trying to forget. But uh, 15 were actually from Selsker, the uh, Selsker area. And for the first time ever, there were some uh, records where they, they were actually trying to represent the whole county and they had to write to the county board for permission for two out outriders as such. And there's a man called Frank Boggan who had a very distinguished career later with Dublin as well. And then a, fr a man called Phelan from Ross. They were the only two outsiders, but it was actually a, a sort of quasi all county team. But when we went looking at it too, uh, when you looked at the census records in 1901, they were all still alive and in the area. But by 1911, one of them had died. So we sort of focused on him, a young man called John McGinn. And from that then, we looked at, he was the first one to die. We looked at the captain and we looked at the last man to die, a man called Tommy O'Connor, who died in 1959. But through the journey, I, I somewhere in my folk memory, I remember somebody saying that there was a medal still floating around. And one of the best things in the book for me was we got a picture that we put into the book we had a long talk about it because it was a, a rolled up page from a newspaper from 1945. So you can imagine how battered and worn that was. Now we tried our best to start to tart it up and make it look good again. But seven of the team are still in it. They celebrated the 50 years anniversary and they're all wearing the medals on watch chains. Mm -hmm. So it shows to them, you know, how important it was to them 50 years later that they were still had the medals and they were still proudly wearing them, you know. And... <clears throat> Pat myself for laughing. I'm not into Facebook at all. I don't do social media. So we set up a Facebook page and call it Sell Scar. So I beat the knowledge behind that one. But we now have, we now have 120 friends, if you wouldn't be dead. But, <laughs> but maybe you'll have, have, have a few more after this. I don't, I don't think so. But one of the things we did was we got uh, George Lawler, who is the current chairman of the county council. Uh, we got George to put up a post uh, looking for a little bit of help. And they actually found a jersey. And we got the captain's jersey from 1893 is still in a drawer in the distillery road in Wexford. And to be able to put that in the book is was absolutely brilliant. And you know. were you able to get a, a, a personal view of the jersey? We got a photo of it, but right. uh, we, we're, we're hoping that something may come of it, you know, because that's such a, a, an important mm -hmm. thing. And uh, we got photos of the medal, one of the medals, and uh, it was actually the man who scored the goal in the All-Ireland final. And uh, that... You can't tell you where that is. No, <laughs> but, uh, less than that. Uh, considering <laughs> not the ball, considering the person who the, the players one was gone. The yeah. players medal that was that was robbed last week. We better not say where no, it might be anyway. But mm. uh, what's out there still was just phenomenal. Really great stuff. You know, very interesting to do. Yeah. How um how long did it take you roughly to compile all the information uh, from the time of starting? From the time you were demanded to well, be involved. To well, well, sorry, yeah, yeah, I suppose my, I, I suppose about a year, year and three months, wasn't it, Pat? Yeah, I suppose. Uh, plus my, my part. Of it. Yeah, your part. <laughs> Liam was a late comer, you know. <laughs> even his GA career. I know you started your GA career early, but uh, finished early too. I think. Yeah, didn't finish finish early, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, we roped Liam in later because Liam has the old, you know, the old education, and he's very good on the computers. So he was excellent at um, improving articles and adding in things like you said, the jersey and the medals and so on. And and the fact that he's so well known as well, everybody kind of. Uh, response to his charm but um i suppose we before covid uh, we, we kind of had gone to the i think it was 20 about 2018 we'd gone to the night classes and it kind of evolved from there uh, there were 10 people involved in the book plus the tutor and so on and uh, each one kind of you know we were given maybe two or three shops to do and premises and um so i think the i think that the main thing that kind of stood out was like i think we had to include the football team because uh, i always felt growing up that they didn't get the recognition i suppose it was a different era not like mm -hmm. the modern game and so on and, and the great teams we've had since but these poor chaps like after a day's work and trying to do a bit of training and uh, you know the personal stories of the of the people involved in the team, but it, it took the bones really of three years to be honest. You know, and COVID intervened, which mm. made it easy in a way to kind of you know to look things up and mm. research and so on. But uh, but what, without this man on my left, it would have never happened. You know, like he he had the kind of the, the knowledge and the expertise, particularly with the computers and the graphics and so on, and he turned our kind of ideas and our stories into the book we have today.
And the the the, the eighteen ninety three team had a very interesting path to success for him. <laughs> they surely did. And uh, I'll just tell Pat his check is in the post. I'll sort of <laughs> out all that craze. Check short, but, uh, is it? <laughs> they surely did because the, the, the funny thing about it was it was groundbreaking in many ways. The first, the Leinster semi-final, I suppose, they beat a team from Westmead. And then in the Leinster final, they were actually being beaten five points to one by a Kilkenny team in Wexford when a row broke out and apparently the Kilkenny lads wouldn't take the field for the start of the second half. Now, it's possibly the only time in the history of the GA where a Wexford football team would be beaten by a Kilkenny football team. But the Leinster Council threw out Kilkenny, so they were awarded the Leinster final by default. But nevertheless, they were still the Leinster champions. And the All Ireland final wasn't played until June 1894. And that too seemed to be a disaster because it was a double header. There was the hurling final and the football final were to be played in the Ashtown Trotting Park, which apparently is out somewhere around Castle Knock. But the guy who organised it, the secretary of the GA, didn't check on the condition of the field. And when the four teams arrived to play, the grass hadn't been cut, it was full of horse manure, and there was absolute eruption. So the game was actually transferred to the Phoenix Park where there's a polo grounds. So it was played where it wasn't meant to be played. And it's probably the earliest recording where uh, the, a, a crowd incited the opponents, which I thought was highly amusing in one way. Are you normally associated with maybe professional soccer clubs throughout the world where there's intense rivalry? But apparently at the start of the second half, the Wexford supporters were heard loudly chanting about the North Cork militia. Now this was less than 100 years after 1798, and the Cork crowd went absolutely berserk. So just for anyone who might be <laughs> for anyone who might be up to date on their history, why yeah. would a, a Wexford crowd chanting at the Cork players about the North Cork militia well, have been about, yeah. why would that have been a, a provocative thing to do? Well I'm trying to get Liam out of trouble now. But um, in seventeen ninety eight the North Cork militia were stationed in Wexford and they were sent out to quell the rebellion and they were, you know they were uh, they were given a, a fair good hiding in um, the Battle of Owler Hill. So, uh, you know, and met, several of them were killed and so on, but they were ruthless in their treatment of the rebels previously and so on. So, um, and the funny, funny thing is many of these North uh, Cork militia spoke Gaelic, spoke Irish uh, yeah, at the time, which is amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And they were fighting against the Irish rebels, in Owler particularly. So um, I think even 200 years later, you know, even the name North Cork militia in Wexford is like an anatomy to the people. So... Uh, I think they took great pleasure out of winning. They, they, they won several battles in 1798 and lost many more, as you well know. But um, this was one of the highlights, I suppose, the fact that the, the men from Owlert were well able for the North Cork Militia. And, uh, you know, they, they never kind of forgot the treatment of, of the rebels and the, what they were like beforehand, you know, before they kind of got the better of them. So, uh, but I'd like to correct Liam as well. There were five teams involved in the... 1893 stroke 94 all ireland and in fairness the Selsky young ireland's beat three of them so they were the four teams so there was only one team that they didn't beat and they were they were beaten in munster so we didn't mm -hmm. do too bad now no, Liam, in no, fairness no. you know no. three out of four or five isn't bad is it? <laughs> <laughs> so the the dispute broke out over the chant with the, 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 dispute the crowd broke chanting out, yeah and then there was a, a one of the wexford players called paddy corn and we came across this across this in the contemporary papers at the time he got a kick and one of the papers said he lost the sight of his eye. The other one said his eye had been knocked out. But the crowd invaded the pitch at that stage. The Dublin, Met the Dublin Metropolitan Police then invaded the pitch to restore order. The corn man was brought to hospital, but as it turned out, he didn't. He was badly hurt, but he, he, he didn't lose the sight of his eye or anything like that. But apparently he went to the police the following day and spoke on behalf of the car person who'd assaulted him. So your man wasn't jailed. But uh, they came home to Rapture's uh, reception. And Pat mentioned uh, it's now gone, but the Temperance Hall was built where people could have a social occasion and celebrations and dances and stuff like that without alcohol. The yeah. Temperance movement was big, of course, from Father Matthew's time in the 1840s. And uh, there's recorded uh, documentation where the Wexford Young Irelands enjoyed the night absolutely brilliantly after the All-Ireland with four barrels of stout sent up by Mrs. Tarnton, who was a publican <laughs> from the quay. <laughs> and the fact that they had that in the, in the temperance hall. hall. <laughs> that sort of amused me. That was their headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> that was their headquarters and meeting room. So I think it was well, well worth a wine meeting up that night. Yeah, yeah. So, 
you know, from that point of view, it was, it, it was great uh, to be able to look look back on, on that kind of stuff. And as I said, then we looked at uh, the captain of the team had a marvellous nickname, a man called uh, Tom Skull Hayes. We looked at his life and uh, we actually reckon he, he's actually related to Brian Malone, or Brian Malone is related to him, so maybe that's another programme for you. <laughs> but trade, uh, looking down through his genealogy, definitely there seems to be a connection. So obviously it was passed on from him. And we also looked at this man, Tommy O'Connor, who was the last one to die in 1959. And again, he seemed to be way, way ahead of himself. People who remember the late, great Cormac McAnallen and the fact that he had a copybook where he used right down a, a personal record of his own matches mm. in a couple of lines and he gave himself a score. But apparently Tommy O'Connor kept an old book from the 1890s about all the matches he played. And years, years later, uh, John, John D. Hickey, who was one of the preeminent GA journalists at the time, interviewed him and he spoke and had great recollections of the all Ireland final and the occurrences and the chanting and all that kind of stuff. And at one stage he said, it wasn't a bad old game till the row started. So. <laughs> <laughs> and was there any, was, was the notebook ever found or was it ever saved? I, 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 I don't know, right. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the medal that we, we have in the book is actually Tommy O'Connor's medal, which yeah. would suggest that, you know, that they, they obviously it seem to have mass somewhere. on that kind of stuff. If it was there, it would be absolutely lovely to see her. Yeah, yeah, well, if, if anyone has the, the notebook, don't be <laughs> saying <laughs> <the notebook, laughs> <absolutely, laughs> yeah. you know. And uh, where did you get, like, so obviously, did you gather most of your information from the people of the area or was it through the internet or you know where where did you kind of find all of the information it's a pretty substantial well, book i suppose you know after the kind of you know that as i said we went on a nine-week course in the people's college and our, our tutor john nangle he trained us how to uh, you know research births deaths and marriages and so on uh, in the National Archives. So, you know, that part wasn't too hard to find, but mm. it was kind of making the connections and so on and linking, you know, that's where Liam came in very handy, you know, like kind of, he, he was kind of, he, he was well informed on the team. He was familiar with the team and the members of the team. Yeah. And there's a plaque actually outside Green Acres uh, that was at the centenary, wasn't it, Liam? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. just, uh, a hundred years later, um, a plaque was put up naming the 17 players. Yeah. And, uh, that one of the things I got great enjoyment was there were two houses side by side and, uh, you know, backing on to where Nicky Rackard's statue is today in, in Selsker Avenue. But between those two houses, there were three O'Connor brothers, Tommy, he mentioned, and there was Peter and John and the other chap next door, uh, John Redmond as well. And, uh, you know, they won four medals between two houses, which I thought was fantastic. You know, we haven't too many all early medals in Wexford, but to have four of them from Selskar in two houses side by side mm -hmm. was phenomenal. And uh, as I said to you, the three, only two of the O'Connor brothers are on the plaque, but the third lad played in the earlier rounds. I think he played in the, mm -hmm. the Leinster yeah. semi-final. Mm -hmm. But I think he was a sub for the final, but I'm sure he got a medal anyway. So, um, you know, that helped uh, between the kind of the, the paperwork and then at the end, you know, a lot of, uh, both of us were teachers in Wexford and schoolmasters and uh, we know, I, I taught in the town for a long time, so I would would have taught, you know, many of the children of Wexford town and it was very much involved in sport myself. So we made connections and so on and even Liam said he wasn't great on social media, but through social media we were able to track down the medal and the jersey and so on. So between the old pen and paper and the computers and the modern technology, we were able to kind of solve a lot the of the problems, you know. Thing, yeah. And as yeah. Liam said, it's great to see what's still out there, yeah. what's in people's drawers and what Absolutely. people, you know. So uh, we'd be delighted, you know, if this, if, uh, a lot of people have got some enjoyment from it and um you know that if it kind of creates an interest and a kind of an appreciation more so that these men you know they didn't get the recognition at the time and maybe 100 years later it's nice to see them their memories and their 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 achievements being acknowledged and it was funny laura there was one day i i, I was saying nothing about it but i i remember distinctly being brought to a grave in crosstown the things irish parents do to their kids at times is <laughs> kind of daft but uh it was the grave of john mcginn and he was the youngest player on the team in 1893, and he died of TB in 1903. And I had an idea where it was, but I didn't want to say anything to the others because I didn't want to look stupid. So out I was in the cemetery anyway, rooting around, and who passed me by only himself? <laughs> <laughs> he was looking for something else. I was looking so for another yeah, grave, yeah. We actually found his grave. We need to get a knife, don't we? <laughs> 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 I just wanted to say, hang around in graveyards. Well, a very interesting places. <laughs> it's, it's actually absolutely amazing because uh, this young fellow, he was described as a general labourer. They obviously wouldn't have had it an awful lot. 
but uh, the Young Irelands in 1903 put a fabulous Celtic crossovers grave and it's inscribed and it acknowledges the fact he was on the Young Irelands team and it mentions then he was a member of the team that won the Crow Cup in 1899 which was the forerunner of the National League but the laugh about that was they actually got the day from the service 1898 <laughs> and we came across that a couple of times but his grave is out in Crosstown now and it's a magnificent yoke and the sad thing about him was his father died when he was only a year old and his mother died when he was uh, after after he died obviously but uh, sh we think she drowned in the riot canal as a 72 year old woman in, in the 1920s so there's no relation to his round mm. but just to be able to mark that and we came mm. across an absolutely beautiful uh, uh, commemoration to him uh, of his of his uh, the actual account of his of his funeral procession and his teammates were there they're all only young men still he was the youngest one of them and he died for us but uh it acknowledged that the priest who buried him visited him and uh the two proudest possessions he had were crow cup medal and saw learning medal so that type of thing just yeah. really makes it very real yeah. you know as opposed to just something in a book around and he was only a young man he was mid-20s was he he was only 27 and he, he was actually mm. a minor when they won and the funny thing about it was which was very poignant when you were reading some of the articles it actually mentioned later in his career he was off farm he didn't seem well he's back to farm he seemed mm. to in one stage it says he's back to his, his color he's back to, the, the the reports at the time were very different mm. uh mm. they were very very strangely written to a, a modern eye mm. but he obviously wasn't well for quite a while before he got up before he eventually died you know so and from reading some notes um on it it seems that there were a team that prepared themselves and took the the whole competition fairly seriously in comparison yeah. to what you would consider was the norm at the time but that, that that's the thing they were very much trendsetters we were very keen on, on sort of emphasizing that because mm. They, they, they actually trained three nights a week, which was unheard of at the time. And <clears throat> there's another man uh, uh, more readily associated with the Martin, Stanley MacDonald, another former teacher. Stanley had done a, a fabulous book about Johnstown and its uh, social life and sporting life. But uh, he identified what where their pitch was. And it was at the, the opposite side. It was very near Crosstown Cemetery. And we were able to highlight that in the book. But we also came across records where... Uh, people would actually go out to watch him train and the GA pitch before it moved up to where we are tonight was in Crosstown and at one stage we came across another town where there was 14,000 at a game over there and they actually had wooden stands and for anybody who's familiar with Wexford where the boat club is uh, that, that was the boat of the old bridge and where the river is at the far side that was where the other side was so you could imagine people just walking across the bridge getting off and the going, train yeah. Go, yeah, and going to the, going to the yeah. pitch and seen but uh they used to train three nights a week as well which was totally unheard of you know mm. so sure, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of teams now that are <laughs> three nights a week as well. i think one of, one of their biggest one of their biggest kind of complaints was that the trainer made him do take a three mile run which was That's kind right. of unheard of then yeah. you know mm. i suppose so the stamina and the cross-country running kind of came in there you know that it could last the duration of a match and probably is fitter if not more fit than the team they were playing you know but it's hugely important then that the railways the original railway station in wexford which is nearly 150 years old now was at the boat club mm. you know and like that was certainly much more important very different today like the red the wall that surrounds the railway station is still there today in its modern form but as clean said the bridge was there so that's why they picked that area for the for the cemetery and the field then was important then as well because I think it was flat, wasn't yeah. it there? And yeah. but when you think of the numbers that were actually attended the matches and so on, and I think county finals were played there before they were, were yeah, moved up here and so on, you know. Yeah. So yeah. you know, we, we kinda look back with the modern eye, but it was very different then, like when you think it was so long ago, mm -hmm. you know. Fourteen thousand people. Yeah. At <laughs> a absolutely. match back yeah. then. Yeah. You'd and imagine. There were a couple of great reports too. There was a report of a county final where they went up to Gory on the train. And uh, during the second half, the ball went flat, which could only happen, but there's no replacement. So they had, to, they had a 10 minute pause before somebody obviously ran down Gory to get a replacement ball and then took off again, you know. That reminds me of a report <laughs> of, I, I was either, it was some inter county game, I can't remember whether it was an All Ireland final or a Leinster final or a Munster final or something fairly important, but. Um, if you look up the records, it says game abandoned after so many minutes mm. because the ball burst. <laughs> no, there was no such one. thing as having more than one. Like It was just the ball burst. Like. But I think they were even in greater trouble because I think when they came back to the railway station, the train was gone. I think the was, was the, gone. So there's no way to get back to yeah. Wexford. They stuck in Gory. They stuck in Gory, yeah. 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 The 10 minutes to get the new ball. You could be stuck in worse places in Gory. 
Pat, the Young Irelands are a club that are no longer in existence. No. But uh, it's not that awfully long ago, relatively speaking, that they were in existence. Well, what happened, I think, um, they knocked down a lot of the houses. I suppose the houses were in bad condition down there. And I, when I was growing up as a young boy, um, many of the old kind of houses had been changed into car parks and so on. So we we plenty of places to play on the on the street. There were less cars around then. And even the temperance hall that Liam uh, talked about, I played in that as a child, as probably a five or six year old in the 1960s. It's so I um, be drinking, Pat. Uh, no, no, there was no, no drink involved in the temperance hall then. Oh, um, yeah. But uh, so... I think many of the kind of the young men and young families, they got houses in different parts of Wexford town. And I think that was part of the death knell. And there was no one really living in the area. So they didn't have the, they didn't have the new players coming in. So when many of the older players hung up their boots and so on, it kind of eventually fell away, you know, I think in the 1950s. But I know that they, they made a, a big effort in the late 70s and 1980s to revive the young Irelands and you know many of the local lads were roped in and so on but um, I couldn't really last because we didn't have the pick and then we were in competition with teams like Liam's team the Sarsfields and uh, you know teams the Volunteers and I think the St Joseph's and Wexford Club are much the same but they've, they've revived been revived and they're doing quite well at the moment mm-hmm. you know so I think the junior team that started off um, in the 70s and so on only lasted about 10 years and it fell by the wayside. But we had some we had reasonably good teams and we did our best in the junior, but we couldn't compete with some of the giants of Wexford Town. And when we went to the country, we were really shown how to play Gaelic football. <laughs> so uh, we kind of uh, we rested our laurels and talked about the past rather than the modern version <laughs> of the Certainly a, a very proud past that, that yeah. every club would love to have. Really. Absolutely, yeah. that's for sure. I, and going back maybe then as well, um, going on yourself, what would be how has the Wexford kind of club scene changed even you know over the last few decades say you know what it, to, from when it was then mm. I, I, what I think teams are gone now yeah. that were mm. well, you in have existence the, the Dan O'Connells were in existence they won a junior championship in 1976 maybe 1977 they're gone out of existence uh, they Wexford there. They, they were Wexford town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a team uh, called the PH Pierce's were in existence for a short yeah. period of time, and I, I think it's funny too when you look at it, like when Pat and I were both in primary school, every boy in Wexford went to the CBS, mm-hmm. so there was nearly a thousand down there when I was in school, mm-hmm. and. I think when you were teaching down yeah, there. Yeah, well, I started, there were 880. 880, I started in 1978. Yeah. So we had, they used to say when we had the school sports, it was harder to win the CBS sports than it was the county championship because we would have 120, you know, in one age group, age group you know. Yeah. So to try and whittle that down to six to three, to, you know, to yeah. a winner. So, um, but... Uh, you know, I, I think there were probably more junior games then, wasn't there? It was more competitive. I know there were yeah. street leagues and all when we were growing up. And they, you know, so you often got people to play in a street league who probably weren't with it club. And they said, mm. you know, Gaelic football's a right game. You know, I'm enjoying this and I meet new people. So um, I think it was, it was more vibrant in... in uh, but, but there wasn't the distractions then that the modern children yeah. and so on have computers and so on. I, I, I think as, as well, well, Laura, when you looked at the, the, the say, housing estates, Bishop's Water... Uh, was a huge housing estate built uh, uh, in Wexford, and the jo- St Joseph's Club absolutely dominated Wexford underage football in the nineteen sixties, mm. and at the same time the Harriers dominated uh, underage hurling, mm. mm. and you know lads who were established seniors when I started you had say Heffa Welsh, Liam Bennett, the four O'Connor brothers, uh, Stella Walker, who's a fella John Walker. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say that in these days, but those lads had county medals for fun, you know, the sort of maybe five, six mm. juvenile county medals. Mm. And when you had large estates like that, the, 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 the club local to them always had their day and they really made hay when the sun shone, as the fellow said. Mm. And definitely at a time when I started in the CBS in, say, the early 1970s, the Sarsfields had an in there and an awful lot of our teams would have come directly from the CBS, you know. Yeah. But then I left the CBS primary school in 1976. Kennedy Park had just opened. Then Skullwira opened. So you had yeah. other schools growing up around yeah. town. And yeah. like the Clannard GA Club are very well established now yeah. up around yeah. the Cool Cats area, you know. So mm-hmm. as the town has moved out, so have the, so have the yeah. clubs yeah. as well. You've had clubs it's more commercial, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And I suppose all the young people the are really living on the periphery yeah. rather than yeah. places yeah. like yeah. Selsker or Bishop's Water. The Marys are one of the yeah. finest pitches in the country. It's absolutely yeah. fabulous yeah. what Marys, they've done yeah. up in Pop yeah. Nick Kelly's field when we were chaps, you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, with, with that urban sprawl, I suppose, you have clubs coming to the fore now, like the Chalmaliers with 
mm-hmm. extra and you have Glen Barn town with mm. you know as as the town yeah. expands yes. yeah. they're expanding yeah, yeah. into catchment areas of those clubs yes absolutely but absolutely. I think in the rural areas I, I taught them the Shell Millers area I taught in Cora Close School for uh, seven years so it was funny shouting for the Shell Millers when we played against them all growing up you know uh, in the, but um, I think there's a, in, in rural areas there seems to be a greater um, pride and a greater commitment and I worked in Isle Gate School as well and with some very good teams up there but whereas in town where we struggle to field teams even in the Wexford CBS you know, and a lot of a lot of lads didn't play hurling or they didn't play the Gaelic sports. They played, you know, the other sports and so on that we all played. But um, in 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 a rural area, there was a huge commitment to your parish and to your local team. And I, I you know, and whereas we only had smaller numbers in the rural schools, we had no problem fielding t- fielding teams, and we had plenty of substitutes. Mm-hmm. And often you had two and three schools, which made the team even stronger. You know, yeah. so uh, that was a huge factor, I think, in 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 in, in, in modern times. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do think in towns too, you may have, as Pat said, you might have a parochial uh, affiliation, but you might yes. have a family one. And I know when I was a chap, you know, you were sent out in the morning and you came home when it was time to be fed. And obviously I came home every day to be fed. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I remember distinctly coming home one evening and my late mother said to me, where were you? And I said, it was over in the college field. The college field at the time, is, well, it, it's still in cool, that's one of them. It was directly behind our house. And uh, so I was playing football and she said, with who? And I said, fill a card to O'Brien and some club called the Volunteers. And she says, you're not going there again. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what's wrong here? And my uncle had played football at the Sars season. He played football at Wexford. And she says, no, nephew, Pat O'Sheen is going to play with the Volunteers. So that was the end of my I was a volunteer for one night. <laughs> and I was sent down to the Sars season after that. And that was only seven, I think, at the time. Funny. Yeah, so and that you never was... looked back since then, like. No, no. So you, you, Sars you do... gain was the volunteer class. <laughs> you know. But you, you do get that maybe in town where you might have a couple of clubs and the lads who lived on our road, they all played with Volunteers, whereas I, I didn't. I walked our road to go to the Sars mm. because that was my Your family, my family yeah. as such, you know, yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, it was easy to do, I suppose, as well. But, uh, you know, when you have a large group in a school, particularly, like, I think back in the year I had to be in school, you had Billy Welsh, Billy Dodd, Nicky Keelan, Paddy Barnes. They all won senior football medals with the Sarsfields. In my class, you had Donald O'Leary, the year immediately behind me, you had Alan Keelan. You know, so there was always a group coming through. Mm. Now, having said that, my particular age group were the worst one of all. Like all the teams immediately beyond us won district titles, got the county semi finals, county finals. We got the BJs kicked out of us every year. We were useless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid the year of uh, 1964 wasn't a good year. Uh, <laughs> what came after? So unfortunately, we let it slip there. But, but uh, we mentioned Sarsfields football. You were on the last Sarsfields team to win the senior football championship league. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was the baby. Uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, we won 1984. And uh, I, I was talking to somebody about it recently. There was a big thing, it was very, very funny. There was a big thing made about it because it was centenary year. Yeah. So we were told before the final that there was going to be a ceremonial throwing in of the ball. And we were playing Duffy Rovers. And uh, Martin O'Neill, who was a very old man at the time, I think he, he was definitely involved in the Leinster Council for years. And I think he could have refereed the All Ireland final in 1947, the one in America. Mm-hmm. He did. And he came out to throw in the ball. And as I said, he was elderly, you know, he was definitely into his 80s. And he threw the ball up, and we all stood waiting, and I think it must be probably was that we were after, lorried down the field. And Martin Fitzhenry hit the post. John Roach, our goalie, got his hand to it and put it out for a 50 or 45, as it is now. And the game continued. But we were standing like loads of man's looking. We thought this was going to restart <laughs> again, but we could have been a goal down after 10 seconds. We were always seconds. a slow starter, don't we? We surely <laughs> were. And it was probably the worst game of football. I think the final score was 1 3 to 4. Quite low, yeah. I think it was the worst yeah. game of football ever played in Wexford, but we didn't care. And, uh, did that rich coming from the, with the winning team? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was funny, yeah, that we were on the last team. and I know that they were beaten in 1997, I was injured that, that year, and they were beaten in 1991 or two, I think I was only back. Yeah. I went to Spain to work for a couple of years after that. But uh, it could be a while before they're back again, but they started dodging relegation the last couple of years. Yeah. But there's a good young group there at the moment. There is, oh, they had a lot yeah. of good young players yeah, this year. Yeah, they've Premiers uh, the ni- on the 19 semi-finals, so please God, it'll come up again. Ah, you know, it's great to see, yeah. yeah. The 80s were also a strong time for Fight Harriers on the Hurling field. You were you, you just about <laughs> missed out in 81, but you would have played in a couple of senior finals as well. Yeah, but we missed out on all them too, because we were beating them for Yeah, I think uh, at one stage... 
Nicky Keelan, Billy Welsh, myself, counted up. We'd been beaten in 21 county finals before we won one. We beat Gus Ran at different a, levels. At now different now levels. Yeah. Yeah. We, we beat Gus Ran, uh, Clangeen, who was basically South Wexford, most of Waterford as well. They had a huge peak up. We bet them in the county minor final. You can see why I robbed them in. It's an encyclopedia <laughs> memory. We beat them in the county minor final in 1980, and it was it was we beat them the third day. There was a, a draw, a draw after extra time, and we beat them extra time the third day. But uh, what do you call it? We were beaten in an under 21. Hurling final in 84, we lost the Hurling final to Buffers Alley in 1984, 85 the senior. So, yeah, you give them all back for one. I've no county hurling medal of any grade, and I have a younger brother who didn't know which end of the hurl to pick up. But Shane's <laughs> come up with a good group of fellas, and he won four. He has four county medals. Shocking. My father has, my father I'm sure he'll give you an order one <laughs> if you feel that bad. You know. No, but I wouldn't be bitter. You know, I wouldn't be bitter. <laughs> And you were quite a good, I don't want to be focusing all on you now, Liam, but you were oh, quite were. a good underage hurler. You played three years county minor. I did, yeah. Uh, well, you were a good adult hurler as well. I don't mean just underage. Well, but thanks very much. I don't think he was that good if we didn't win that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I was lucky enough. We, we, we won the Leinster minor title in 1980 and we got to an All-Ireland final. I was actually dropped for that, so I didn't mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, Tipperary beat us. And uh, the gas thing about it was uh, we were badly done in the Leinster final in 1981. And if you ever read any of Billy Welsh's stuff, he said that the 1981 Leinster final was the reason he concentrated on boxing. We were absolutely robbed in the last minute. Typical. John Codder was probably the best miner in the country at the time. He had a horrific injury. Tom Dempsey was only a juvenile. Tom was too young to realise how stupid he was. <laughs> he, scored, he scored a goal in two points in the first five or ten minutes. And the third time he threw a ball over to Kenny Defender, said, your man hit him with the hand of the horn and opened him up. Oh, right God. over his eye, down his nose. So Tom went away for about 45 minutes. Uh-huh. And we're beating in the Leinster final. But Billy Wells said that single game was the one decision. He was going to concentrate on something where he was in sole control. Not a referee or not a linesman or not teammates, you know. Mm. So yeah, we had a good old run, and uh, yeah, it was great crack. But look yeah. at the stories you have to tell out yeah. of all those experiences. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not a lot to show for, but it was, it was good, great fun. And you yeah. got the opportunity to don the purple and gold for yeah. the Wexford seniors a couple of, a few times as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, that was that was great. Uh, I, I was very lucky, uh, I suppose. I come up with great fellas. It was funny. George was here earlier. George O'Connor. Uh, George was very, very good to me when I was a young fella starting off. Uh, <laughs> at one stage he said I, I was a year younger than John I would have known John better John was a year ahead of me in school George was gone but uh, at one stage he invited me out did I want to go out to do hay so I didn't care he was paying me I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't realise it actually meant doing physical work <laughs> damn you're killing me and for the town he gone out to Pierce the town every horse play said there's a fella coming out full of sugar and uh, I was absolutely hammered but uh, <clears throat> He'd bring myself and Sack Welsh and Martin Wheatley. He was the driver to training and sort of went on for years. It was great, great fun altogether. And uh, <clears throat> I suppose <laughs> the last day I played senior was the first day they changed the jerseys. I, I don't know, you're probably too young to remember. They, they rejigged the jerseys in 1987. And this was before. To the yellow belt. They, 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 yeah. they had a yellow bottom and a purple top, obviously, mm. weed narrow stripes across the middle. And fellas went ballistic. Re- we were useless. We were just now we're beaten all right, but the jersey had nothing to do with it, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the rubbish that went on the paper afterwards. And that same year we trained over the winter in Pierce's town and uh, we got a salad, which was unheard of because before that you got there was two two dozen bottles of milk appeared in Patrick Park and rubber ham sandwiches. <laughs> it, it was twenty six train and two fellas didn't get milk. It was just that's the way it was. Yeah. Mickey Lynch got them who was brilliant. Mickey took after the tea and I never drank tea, I drank coffee. They hadn't hope of getting a cup of coffee. <laughs> but nineteen eighty seven was the first Michael O'Grady, who was a Christian brother here at the time, yeah. he was the he was the trainer of the team. And uh, we had a trainer, we did weights and it sort of backfired. We went very flat against Kilkenny that year. But we were absolutely pilloried over, you know, because that wasn't going to happen. I suppose it really was the start of maybe treating things more Seriously. professionally, you yeah. know, because uh, we often asked, I, I heard in 1985, and James O'Connor, who was magnificent in 1984, James Duffery was sent back on the team, and he was hurt going into the Leinster semi-final, and he did a fitness test in Pierce's town, 
where he ran across the pitch of Pierce Town against the county chairman, a brilliant man from your called Simon Kendi. <laughs> and Simon was wearing a suit and a pair of flat shoes. And James beat him in the sprint and was past fit to play. And, and I, was only, I was only 20 and I was thinking, oh, there's something wrong here because <laughs> none of the leash lads are going to be wearing a suit and a pair of flat shoes. And that's no reflection on Simon or James, but that was just the way it was. It was, it was you know, it was amateur it's hour now. Well, it the was, next, the next time Lee Chin has to do a fitness test, we put him out into extra bag. <laughs> against against, against Michal Martin yeah. and see how it goes. So yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a challenge for Michal. Yeah. Uh, but it was just the way it was. You know, yeah, they were Michal a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you have so many great stories to tell, but um, yeah. what would some of your favourite stories from the actual book be? Um, well, you know, the three characters, I, I like the kind of, you know, the GA, the, 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 those sports as well. Um, but I suppose um, I grew up down there, as you know, and, uh, you know, there was a Redmond family who, you know, who one of their relations was on the Selsko Young Ireland's team. They're, I think the, the, the older man was a founding member, this Joseph Redmond, mm. and his brother was on the winning team, James Redmond. But, um, uh, they had pigs in the centre of town, which was amazing. And there were there were some of the chief pig buyers for a bowls of Waterford, and they were they were recognised throughout you know the United Kingdom. Even they were you know they were known in Birmingham and Liverpool and London. But uh, a funny story happened to me when I was young. We were playing the, we were playing Gaelic football on the street, and and and, and, and often the Redmond brothers would be out chasing us because we were upsetting the pigs, even though you know we were children at the, at the time. But uh, their dog. Uh, came out and bit me on the leg. I was 10 years of age. And uh, Seamus Redmond said to me, uh, you scraped it off a car. <laughs> so even though I had fang marks on me, like, <laughs> you know, the dog didn't do it. He had an alibi. So I kind of, I so when I researched their family and so on, I looked back with great fondness. And I suppose I, I interviewed a, a local man who worked there as a child in the 1950s. And he, uh, we, Liam was good enough to, 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 to put the story in the book. And, uh, he told me that he'd uh, a man called um, Dennis Franey. He's 86 years of age now, Hale and Hearty. But he told me great stories that he worked for Sixpence, a tanner, as they called it, in the old money, 6D. You're, you're too, too young to remember this. And uh, and two eggs for his poor mother. So that was his payment. I wonder would many of the younger oh children gosh. today and teenagers work for Sixpence and two eggs for their mother. So... <laughs> Once you had a kind of a, a connection or a bond with the people and, you, you, you know, you heard about different things that happened to him. And these men would go over. He had no, no such thing as a car or a truck or anything like that or even a tractor. He had a, a push bike and he would balance two, um, two buckets of slop. So the people that did, you know, what, what it was thrown out, very little was thrown out in those days. But I suppose the peelings of potatoes or mm. food that wasn't eaten. So he would go around the town and collect the leftovers, the scraps, and bring them back to feed the pigs because they had multiples of pigs, tens, twenties, thirties pigs in a small area. And to the modern day, in, in Spectrum Art Gallery today, uh, they have an art gallery and in, in it's actually was alongside uh, the Redmond family home where the pigs were kept and so on, in, in the, in the, obviously in the garden, in the backyard. And they called uh, the art gallery the Pig Yard uh, gallery which is a kind of a nice tribute to the yeah. to you know to the people of, of, of years ago and uh seemingly these redmonds were very good to the patricia and tony robbins when they moved down to spectrum in Wexford, you know but uh, i think he told i'll just tell you one quick one before we, we finish um and very much like this year wexford played dublin this year i was at the match and dublin beat them by one point and it probably cost wexford you know in the long run of getting into the leinster final but uh was it Billy Rackard had the furniture mm -hmm. shop on Wexford, a uh, brother, Nicky Rackard, one of the three famous uh, Rackard brothers. But he, he knew that the Redmonds, whereas they weren't great players themselves, but they had a fanatical interest in the Gaelic games, particularly in the, the great Wexford team of the 50s. But Wexford were tipped to beat Dublin and get into the Leinster final. And it seemed they only had to play two more games and they would have been All-Ireland champions. Mm -hmm. So the rods on favourites going in against Dublin in the early 50s. And of course, I think that, you know, they let it slip. Maybe they underestimated their opponents. But Dublin won by one point, very much like this year. And uh, so Jackie was going down the next morning and Billy Rackard in his book had always written that 
this Redmond man was very proficient at, he was able to balance the bicycle so that he wouldn't spill a drop of the pig's will or whatever. But seemingly on the Monday after the match, Billy was out fixing the furniture and getting his window display ready. And he said that uh, Jackie Redmond looked at him and whatever way, <laughs> whatever happened, didn't he lose his balance and <laughs> buckets and bicycle. <laughs> so Billy said that he probably got blamed for that as well. <laughs> so I thought it was a great story. And so we recounted it, but it was taken from no hurling at the dairy door by, yeah. by the records, yeah. which was fantastic, it, you know. Again, there was a picture that we used in that book as well, and there was a, a family in Selsker called Murray's, and there were, say, photogra- there, there were photographers' choice of the papers at the time, and uh, Michael Murray was a very, very famous uh, sports photographer. And there's one photo he t- takes in the Rock this final, 1951, where you have... Uh, the records in Art Foley running out of, the, uh, of, of Croke Park onto the pitch, and it's just, it, it was called a moment in time, and that was grand, that was lovely, we used that. But there was one later on in Billy Records' book, and Pat said, We started this in COVID, and I was sort of fiddling around trying to keep myself going, from going mad at <laughs> home, and I had found a, a free program called GIMP, very unfortunate name, but it's for manipulating and colouring and fixing photos and stuff. And I was messing around with one of the photos from uh, uh, No Hermit at the Dairy Door and I went about colouring it and it's actually a picture of the homecoming in 1956 and Nicky Rackard standing on the roof of a car, no health and safety. Nico <laughs> 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 Donald is behind him, but sitting up on the car is Michael Murray, the photographer. So obviously somebody took a picture of the photographer from the street but Art Foley is sitting on the bonnet, and it was only when we coloured the photo, has the red plaster down his ear, or obviously he got, or down his, his hair lock, where obviously he got in the belt the previous day of the famous save. Mm. But it's a lovely photo, yeah. and even though it was taken at night, during the homecoming, you know, to be able to freshen it up and give it yeah. a bit of colour to it, yeah. it was fabulous. Yeah. And again, this little old yokes like that made it really worth yeah. it, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, and in the book, you've used some of some of those techniques to freshen up some of the photographs in the book, I think, as well, Liam. Is that right? We, we did, yeah. And as I said, some of them, we, we sat down as a group and we sort of said some of the photos were in poor enough condition, but we decided to put them in because of their importance rather than their quality. But most of them are, are actually, the quality is very, very good. And there's one particular picture there, uh, Pat's a very, took Pat an awful long time. It's a picture taken of uh, a group of kids, not mm-hmm. to do with the GA, at the gates of Selsk but isn't there four American sailors in her five American sailors? And it happened that these were the lads who had brought the statue of John Barry to Wakesford, or to oh. Rosslair Harbour, and they were in town. And there was a great line in the local paper where uh, they went to a dance in the town hall, and the young ladies were delighted. <laughs> now, I'd say the young men weren't too pleased. There were probably a couple of punches and kicks. Going, but, uh, Pat, Ma- I, I sort of fit yeah. around with the photo, but Pat managed to find and name every kid in the photo. Is there 20? Yeah, they're 25, 25, and uh, a couple of them are dead. But um, I actually hung around when I was growing up. There's a little boy in the photograph, and he's less than four years of age, Terence Gehaw, and uh, he's 70. <laughs> He come up soon, so it's, it's you were doing the maths, you know. It's sixty six years ago, and uh, um, so his brother now I think took the photograph, and uh, but he was able to name a lot. And uh, one of the ladies actually came down from Ballinasloe to the launch of uh, this book in the Wexford County Council headquarters there in October, and uh, she's an infant in the arms of another lady. Right. But we found most of the names, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And funny, the gates of Selsker Abbey haven't changed. Yes. They definitely haven't been painted, but they haven't <laughs> changed, and they've rarely been opened ever since, you know. So, and again, it was part of my childhood growing up, so it was great to actually name, and there were, you know, four or five fellas on the gate. But when you think these American sailors must have been like astronauts, you know, yeah. you imagine Wexford people had never seen a man of colour, or the never seen you know americans with tans and so on mm. so i suppose you know particularly to a child like seeing you know no television then in 1956 so mm. you know as you know even printing that in the book you know that kind of gave me great satisfaction special, yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, just two more things to mention then i suppose mm. if someone wants to get their hands on a copy of this book i i, I hear that you're selling out so quickly that you're hardly able to keep up lads well we, we first pr- of all what is the story if, if someone is watching this and thinks <laughs> i really want that book how are they going to get it um, and did me and peter get i was going to say go to the Wexford, <laughs> go to the Wexford Library. No, but uh, no, I think there are a few copies. There are a few copies still for sale down in the Red Book yeah. bookshop down in St Peter's Square in Wexford. But we printed. You see, it's hard to know. We didn't realise uh, the level of interest. And I think 
a lot of the credit goes to Liam as well. I think the GA angle really um, brought the book, it lifted yeah. the book up. You know, yeah. before that it was 18 or 19 buildings and famous people and not so famous. I think we got it right with the extraordinary life of ordinary people. But I wrote Liam, I think that the funny thing was, I, I said to him um, at one stage, you, you're a great man for the GA. Why don't you look up about the Selsko Young Ireland's? And three days later, he came back with eight typed pages and several <laughs> photographs. That's the type of man he is because it's a labour of love for him. Looking up something like that is not work. You and me, it's not maybe mm. to you people, but to me, it would be work. But to him, he got to the ends of the earth to find out different pieces of information. So I think, and I think he really brought it to life when he focused on the three. We were very much taken with, you know, a lot, a lot of the people died. Of, there was a lot of infant mortality and consumption and bronchitis mm. and all these things mm. and phistisis, whatever the name of, of it was. So um, several of the Young Ireland's team players probably died of consumption, you know, which yeah. was sad. It was at the time. Mm. But when, when he actually, um, when we picked the three people, like the, the, the youngest man to die, the, one, the man who lived to 85, and the captain was a character himself. So that actually brought it to life, you know, when you actually put these take the men out of the picture and put flesh and bone on them. And I think many of their great-grandchildren and grandchildren, some of them are still alive, have taken a great pride and a great kind of, you know, just saying, like, my uncle played or my granduncle or my great-grandfather played on that team and he was a great player and he's an All-Ireland medal. You know, mm-hmm. you know so I think even, even doing that, and as I said, my huge interest in it was kind of giving these men the credit that they probably didn't get. You know, I suppose Wexford thought they were going to win many All-Irelands and only mm-hmm. a matter of time before they win the next one. Mm-hmm. But it took, you know, after the four in a row, you know, we haven't known one since. So I think that it was a monumental achievement and from a, from a, just such a small area and from a small group of streets, with it, as Liam said, with the two extra, the man brought in from New Ross and the man brought in from Enniscorthy. But it was a phenomenal achievement, just like the one in uh, 1910 for the Shell Malayers and Castlebridge. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we need to give these players the credit that they were due because after doing a day's work and, and you know long yeah, hours yeah. and very physical work, mm-hmm. have to go train and go and play. And, uh, you know, even even and even the supporters that Liam, Liam has in the book as well, how much it cost people to go to Crow Park and so on. And yeah. money was tight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, often um, it was nearly a week's wages to go up and watch and pay yeah, in to get in to see the match. So people made huge sacrifices and some people cycled on bicycles. You know, you've all heard the yeah. stories cycling to Crow Park and so on. So people, you know, nowadays we get buses, we get trains, we go in our car and we give out still. But the people made huge sacrifices to go and see their heroes. And these were legends at the time, you know. Yeah. And as part of the plans from Wexford GA point of view to try and help bring attention to these players, a jersey has been launched, mm-hmm. That's a right, commemorative yeah. jersey, mm-hmm. and it'll be worn by the Wexford teams in the month of January, we're told, yeah. and it's a very nice jersey. Liam. Yeah, that, that was a phenomenal thing, because one of the things that struck me about the, the, the jersey, the lady who gave us the picture of the jersey sort of said, oh, it's in shock and poor condition. I said it's not bad now for 130 years, you know, cup, there's a couple of holes and this, that and the other thing, but it's a green knitted woolen jersey. You wouldn't wear it now, you'd die, the heat. <laughs> but the the crests, you can see in the photo on the book, the crests are all slightly different, so they're all obviously hand embroidered by either a mother or a wife or a sister, because they weren't commercially done. Mm. And the fact that uh, Michal Martin, when we, we, we contacted Michal about maybe getting a little bit of help with uh, publishing the book, Straight away he lit on the idea of the jersey and the fact that there was a jersey still available. And a couple of weeks later he came back and he said, look, we're thinking of doing this. What would you think? And I said, God, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. But he said, like, I, I have, keep talking about the IT stuff. I'm not bad with the IT, but the phone misses me. Big time, <laughs> I have to say. So he sent me a picture that apparently disappears the first time you look at it. <laughs> so I had to contact him again and I contact him I think he thought he was talking to an idiot but I kept losing it when I look at it and of course I said just this is brilliant I look at it again it's gone but the, it's a green jersey and an awful lot of people start to say what are Wex for doing wearing a green jersey but even that they actually ask why are they wearing it it'll draw awareness to it and at the back then there's a beautiful little crest which is the Selsky of Ireland's crest of the harp with the shamrocks around it you know so just to have that there is, is, is brilliant and just as a very quick aside Pat mentioned there about uh, lads who had died young and this that and the other thing when we were doing this research we were hoping against hope in a bizarre way that uh, the person died in Wexford because the registrar was uh, Dr Tom Pierce, who had the most beautiful handwriting and it was easy to read the records because some of them were heinous God, mm. you couldn't read them it was shocking mm. bad but his son was Todd Pierce, who played in the All-Ireland Final in 1918 
but he played as Pierce Todd because the father wouldn't allow him. He was a student in Dublin and the father forbade him from playing football. So he played in 1980 as Pierce Todd. He was picked to play on the Dublin team. He was still a student for uh, Bloody Sunday, but didn't turn up because he, he didn't go to the match because he was studying. So he missed playing with the Dublin team during Bloody Sunday. He won not Ireland and two Leinsters with Dublin afterwards. But he was later the registrar in Wexford after his father, and he actually recorded the debts of Most of some of, some of his own dads, which was quite, yeah, yeah. you know, again, one of them sort of quirks and poignancies yeah. that they were there. And he was a phenomenal sportsman. He won a Sigerson, he won a Fitzgibbon, he won a Provincial Towns rugby medal afterwards. Yeah, with Wexford with Wexford. only, with Wexford Wanderers. And yet nobody, very few people know of mm. Paddy Pierce and Paddy Achieved, you know. And mm. even just to, maybe somebody say, oh God, yeah, I remember reading mm. about him or... He was probably He's the reach-in of his time, you know. Probably so, you know. Yeah. Or the George yeah. O'Connor, should we say. <laughs> George, because George has not learned the reach-in. Not yet, not yet. He has time. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, lads, I think uh, it's been a very interesting discussion, I have to say. I've really enjoyed listening to your tales, both of your tales, and I'm sure, Laurie, you're... Absolutely. Yeah. Bored behind that, if you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, very interesting. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's really, really interesting, and, and thanks very much for joining us, lads. Thank you very much for asking us. Delighted, then, you know. Can't wait to read the book. Good. <laughs> <laughs> My free book. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> On the Couch is sponsored by Murphy's Furniture, who've been supporters of Wexford GA for many years. Murphy's have two shops in Wexford, one in Gorey and one in Wexford Town. Along with a huge range of furniture, sofas, beds, and mattresses, Murphy's are now launching their carpet and flooring ranges across their five shops this December. They also have stores in Carlow, Nace and Dublin. Anthony and Nicky Murphy are proud supporters of Wexford GA and are delighted to now offer flooring to the people of Wexford 